Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm going to be giving an overview of the Vandal Spectroscopic Survey, briefly talk about what it is, and then try and provide some motivation for why we uh, went to the bother of doing it, and then have a very brief run through some of the science highlights that have come out of the survey over the last couple of years. And then if I've got any time left at the end, I'll uh, talk about where we might go in the future. So the Vandal Spectroscopic Survey um, was one of the last two public surveys that were done with the Weimar Spectrograph before it was decommissioned. The other one, of course, being the Legacy Survey that we heard about on Monday. Um, like the Legacy Survey, we're basically allocated about a thousand hours of visitors time on Weimar over about a three year period. Uh, whereas Legacy was looking at intermediate redshift galaxies, uh, the Vandal survey was predominantly looking at star forming galaxies in the high redshift universe. So 80, 85% of our targets were kind of star forming galaxies between redshift two and a half and seven. Uh, but we had a, a decent sized subsample looking at passive galaxies or quiescent galaxies at redshift one to one and a half effectively. Now, obviously in the 10 years before we started, there'd been many high redshift surveys with Vimos. So you might ask the question, what's the point in doing another one? Well, the, the unique feature about this survey was the integration times, basically. So there was a minimum integration time of 20 hours per object, going all the way up to 80 hours for the faintest targets. And it's moderate resolution, and it's over a wide range of optical wavelength. And we targeted two fields. The Candles fields in UDS and Chandra Deep Field South is where we looked, um, because these are the fields that had the best multi-wavelength data for getting stellar masses and, and photometric redshifts for doing our initial selection. So what was the motivation? Well, really, we wanted to have long enough integration times to get high enough signal to noise to try and extract useful physical information from the absorption lines in the continuum of these high redshift galaxies and these passive galaxies as well. So I've got two plots here, uh, both of which actually come from the GMAS spectroscopic survey, which was done about 15 years ago now. And the top one is a stack of star forming galaxies at redshift of about two. And the bottom one is a stack of uh, quiescent or passive galaxies at redshift of about one and a half. And basically, we wanted to get spectra of this kind of quality for a much larger statistical sample um, and at higher redshift. And combine that with the excellent multi-wavelength photometry that was available to try and extract as much physical information as we possibly could. So we looked at these two fields in the UDS and the China Deep Field South. It was eight pointings of Vimos in total, so four in each field. And that's what's shown on this left-hand diagram here. So they were centered on the, the deep HST uh, imaging that was available in those fields. Selection wise, it was predominantly H-band magnitude selected with photometric redshifts. There was additional criteria for selecting the, the passive subsample as well. And a huge amount of work went on at the start of the survey trying to derive the most reliable uh, photometric catalogs we could and, and, and improve the, the photometric redshifts that were available. So that was a lot of work initially, but it, it turned out to be uh, well worth the effort in the end. This left hand plot here shows the input redshift distribution of vandals in black. So that's the targets that we select, you know, the redshift distribution of the targets we selected uh, based on their photometric redshifts. And you can see the vast majority are at redshift greater than three. Uh, we have a lump of uh, a brighter star forming galaxies at redshift kind of two and a half. And then we have this substantial subsample of passive galaxies between redshift one and uh, about two. In various different colors in the background there, you can see the, the comparable redshift uh, distributions of various other famous uh, spectroscopic surveys over the last sort of 10, 15 years or so. So here's our two samples on the star formation versus stellar mass plane. OK, so we've got, our, we've got our star forming sample shown in blue here and our quiescent sample shown in red here. And basically what we were aiming at was getting a fair sampling of the main sequence of star formation at these redshifts. That's what we were trying to do with the star forming sample. And then obviously uh, look at the, the potential uh, descendants of these galaxies uh, in redshift one or so in the, in the quiescent population. So if you want the full gory details of all the selection and the, and, uh, the data reduction and everything, then you can, you can find that information in the two papers that we, that we published to go along with the first data release. Now the survey is actually finished and the final data release of the survey, which was data release four, is now fully publicly available via the ESO archive and has been since February this year. Uh, the full data, the details of DR4 are in the, the release paper by Bianca Guerrilli, which has also just been published. 
in the end of the day, we ended up with just over 2000 spectra and they're all publicly available, both the one dimensional and the two dimensional spectra, the spectroscopic redshifts with all the, all the necessary quality flags, plus all the photometry used, plus a, a set of SED fitting parameters. So it's quite a rich data set that's available. So we'd encourage people to use it if possible. Here's the final redshift distribution we ended up for our target. So the, the solid histogram here is the object where we've got incredibly robust spectroscopic redshifts and then the open open portion of it is where the, the redshifts are less robust. Um, so you can see basically this is more or less exactly what we said we'd get, okay, based on the photometric redshift. So the selection in that respect has worked pretty well. This is the, this is the final plot showing our, our spectroscopic redshifts for this sample versus the, the input photometric redshifts that we use to select them. Uh, and it's pretty tight. And the, the key figure here is the outlier rate, the catastrophic outlier rate is only 1%, okay? So we wasted very few of these slits in the end of the day. So because we've got such long exposure times, we have kind of 10, 15% of these uh, galaxies where we've got very high signal to noise on an individual object by object basis. And analysis of those is going on at the moment. But inevitably most of the science that's been done to date, and I, I guess most of the science that will be done for this survey is based on stacking these spectra as a function of different physical parameters. So for an example, you can stack spectra on the star formation rate, stellar mass plane, Here's an example of one of the stack spectra of, of star forming galaxies at Redshift 3. There's about 100 objects in that stack, I believe. So you can see here that we've got a huge amount of detailed information that we can extract from the, from the UV continuum of these, of these objects. And of course, you can play exactly the same game with uh, the passive sun part sample as well and do the, do the same sort of analysis. Now, science highlights. Um, in the sort of seven minutes that I've got available, I'm not going to be able to do justice to all the different studies that have actually happened on this data set to date. There's been all sorts of different projects underway looking at different aspects of high redshift galaxy science. I've put together a sort of non-exhaustive list of, uh, of some of the recent ones here. And with apologies to the authors of these papers, I'm not going to be talking about these results at all. Okay, this is just an advert that lots of people have done lots of interesting things. What I'm going to concentrate on is some of the results that we've published on the stellar metallicity of these high redshift galaxies and on the star formation histories of the passive galaxies at lower redshift. And basically I'm going to concentrate on that because that was the two of the key science goals that we set out in the original proposal, if you like. Okay, it was the sort of main goals of the, of the survey. So in terms of the stellar metallicities at a high redshift, Fergus Cullen uh, published one of the first papers on this from the survey, I think based on the second date release of the of, of Vandals. Um, and he was fitting the stellar metallicities of galaxies in stellar mass bins uh, between redshift 2.5 and 5.5, doing full spectral fitting with the Starburst 99 and BPASS models. And here's an example here. So here's one of the, one of the stacked spectra uh, with the model fit in red through it. And the results from this are shown in the in the bottom right diagram here. So this is uh, stellar metallicity versus stellar mass. The red triangles you can see at the top here are the results for star forming galaxies um, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the black points here are the results from Fergus's study of these star forming galaxies at redshift 3.5, so 10, 11 gig years earlier in the universe's history. And you can see that both data sets are consistent with following the same sort of sloped relationship, but there's a clear offset here. Okay, so the metallicities at redshift 3.5 are, are lower by a factor of four or so. And now I should say that Antonello Calabro did uh, a similar study looking at metallicities at high redshift using a, a slightly different technique. Now, I'm not going to uh, talk about this at all because uh, Antonello was actually talking in, I think, two talks time, so I won't destroy his talk, but you can, you can look forward to the full data of that in half an hour's time or so. Um, Fergus moved on to look at um, the metallicities of our galaxies as a function of their Lyman alpha equivalent width. So on the right hand side here, you can see four stack spectra, which are binned in terms of the equivalent width of the Lyman alpha emission line, going from high equivalent width at the top here to uh, low equivalent width at the bottom. And you can see here that there's a clear trend for the metallicities of these galaxies to drop off as they go to higher and higher Lyman alpha equivalent widths, okay, which is kind of consistent with them having uh, lower metallicity and therefore harder UV continuum and therefore more efficient at producing these Lyman alpha photons, if you like. Although the work that Fergus did also sort of emphasise that actually the, the, the equivalent width of the Lyman alpha that we actually see at the end of the day is, is more governed by the, by the opacity, so the combination of, of dust and neutral hydrogen absorption. Um, Ayush uh, Saxna looked at metallicity in a different context. He uh, was looking at the properties of galaxies and vandals that produced 
uh, noticeably strong helium-2 emission. So here's two stacked spectra here. The top one is helium-2 emitters, and you can see the strong helium-2 emission here. And then the bottom uh, stack is, is non-emitters. And he was looking for an explanation for what's going on, why, what, what is responsible for producing this strong helium-2 emission. Um, what he discovered was that the, in terms of the stellar mass star formation rates and metallicities, there appeared to be no difference from the parent population. Okay, so there's no clues there. So, but there's clearly some extra source of high ionization photons, high energy ionization photons needed for these, uh, to produce this helium-2, either from X-ray binaries or AGN or some other source. Investigations are continuing. The very latest paper on the metallicity stuff uh, is just been published in the last couple of months, and that was combining the stellar metallicities, or effectively iron metallicities that we get from the rest frame UV spectra from vandals, with near infrared spectroscopic follow up uh, from MOS fire on the Keck telescope. So the near infrared follow up gives us O2, O3, H beta, et cetera, and allows us to calculate what the gas phase metallicity is for these objects, okay, or effectively the oxygen metallicity, if you like. And um, by comparing the two for the, I think, 30 something galaxies where we had this combined data set, you can try and investigate what the alpha enhancement is in these star forming galaxies at redshift of about three or so. And that's what's shown in the bottom diagram here. So we have stellar mass along the bottom and we have metallicity uh, on the vertical axis. The blue data points here are the stellar masses which are extracted from the, from the vandal spectra themselves. And then the red data points here are the gas phase metallicities, which are coming from the MOSFAR data, which is compared to a, a relationship derived by Ryan Sanders, who's, who will no doubt talk about some of this material later today. And you can see both the, the stellar and gas phase metallicities are uh, lying along the same slope here, but there's a consistent offset between them, which is a, a factor of two and a half or so. So they've got an alpha enhancement of about two and a half, a redshift 3.5, which is consistent with these galaxies having a, you know, star formation history timescales, which are significantly less than a, than a gig year. So that's, the, that's some of the results on, on the metallicity work at high redshift. The other thing I said I would talk about briefly is work on the star formation histories of the passive galaxies within sample. One of the science products of, of the Vandal survey arguably is uh, a new uh, Bayesian spectrophotometric fitting code called Bagpipes, which was, which was written by Adam Carnell. And he was actually working on the Vandals data set as part of his PhD and wrote this uh, software uh, specifically, or at least originally, to analyze the, the, the Vandals data set. You can use it to analyze just photometry alone. And this, this diagram here is showing uh, a Bagpipes SED fit to, to a candidate passive galaxy at redshift three or so. And because it's all set up within a proper Bayesian framework, then it, you get proper sort of median procedure uh estimates for the parameters and, and uh, proper error estimates as well but the real beauty of the code is that you can use it to fit the spectroscopy and photometry simultaneously okay and this is an example fit here of one of the vandals passive galaxies being uh, fit by bagpipes uh, fitting the spectra and the photometry together and also fitting the, the the calibration uncertainties in the spectra and folding those uncertainties into uh, into the parameter estimates in a sort of rigorous fashion Adam applied this code to um, the passive galaxies within vandals uh, coming from the second data at least, so basically half the sample that we had at that time, trying to look at the range of different star formation histories that these galaxies might have had. And that's what's shown on the left-hand side here. So this is uh, the star formation histories of these 70-something passive galaxies stacked um, in four bins of stellar mass. Now you can see that on an object-by-object -object basis, there's a wide variety of different star formation histories recovered from this spectrophotometric fitting. But there's a definite systematic trend that as we go to higher and higher masses, these objects tend to be formed at higher and higher redshift. Okay, and that, that information is displayed in this diagram here. This is formation of redshift versus stellar mass. Objects are basically color coded by the specific star formation rate in this plot. Now it's clearly a lot of scatter. It's quite a hard thing to recover from these, from these data, but uh, there's a systematic downsizing trend where the more massive things have been formed earlier in the universe's history. The very latest work on this is being done by a PhD student, Massey, in Edinburgh, who's working on trying to combine the coescent or passive galaxy information that's in the Vandals survey with what's previously uh, at lower redshifts in the Legacy survey. Okay, so here's a preliminary result showing, uh, trying to look at the age of these galaxies as a function of stellar mass, basically. So this is the D4000 index versus stellar mass for the Legacy sample at a redshift of about 0.7. 
in three different mass bins, and here's the stack spectra that go with it. And you can see that we see the trend in, in D4000 increasing with stellar mass as these galaxies get progressively older. And we can actually see exactly the same trend happening within vandals um, sort of two giga years earlier in cosmic time. Okay, we've got a bit less statistics, um, but in the same three mass bins, and here's the, here's the stack spectra from vandals, which show exactly the same uh, effect of D4000 increasing uh, with stellar mass. Okay, so final slide then, before I outstay my welcome completely. Um, what are the future prospects? Well, as another advert, just to remind you that the, the, all of the data I've been talking about just now is all fully public, okay? And you can read all the details in Guerrilla et al. 2021, and you can access all of it uh, either through the ESO archive or you can get it through uh, a dedicated Vandals website that we have as well. It's probably worth saying that the scientific exploitation of the data set is only really properly going underway now. We haven't actually had the full DR4 data set with all the spectroscopic redshifts, et cetera, uh, for particularly long. So there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, but in the future, a lot of the science is going to be trying to combine it with uh, near infrared spectroscopy. So I've already talked about the MOS fire follow-up we have. We have a couple of KMOS programs running and one on the LBT as well. People are putting in uh, further follow-up proposals for HST and, of course, ALMA next week. But perhaps the most exciting uh, ancillary data set that's coming along is from James Webb Space Telescope. When the, when the announcements were made the other week about what programs are going to be uh, run in cycle one, there's a public uh, imaging program called JWST Primer, which is going to provide 10-band NORCAM imaging and media imaging as well. And that's focusing uh, at least half of its integrations on one of our fields. So it's going to look at the, the UDS field and a lot of the Vandals galaxies will be covered by that imaging. And of course, our other targets in the Chandra Deep Field South should, should be largely covered by the, the JWST Jade's GTO program at some point in the future as well. Okay, I'll finish there.